What is going on everyone, I'm here Stuart Hilbert and this is part 2 in my series on the first Tudor monarch, Henry VII. Now in today's episode, I'm going to be taking a look at the consolidation of power from 1485 to 1500. Hope you all enjoy. So first of all, let's quickly look at what happened in the last episode, which was the Battle of Bosworth, in which Richard III, the last Yorkist king, the last Plantagenet king, was killed at the Battle of Bosworth, and when Henry VII became king of England. Although this is, of course, just the start of his very interesting story. Now, of course, after the battle, this is the start of the Tudor dynasty, and this is where we get the Tudor monarchs because of his victory there. And in today's episode, as I said, we're going to be looking at what came next in his story. So, of course, the initial aftermath of Bosworth is that they have all these Yorkist prisoners because not everyone was killed. In fact, not a very large amount of people was actually killed at Bosworth in comparison to other battles of the time. Lots of people just surrendered after Richard had been killed. And remember, if you haven't seen that video, this video might not make too much sense, so uh, I'll leave it in the description below if you want to go and watch part one before you start on here. So actually, something that's important to note is that the Battle of Bosworth took place on the 22nd of August, 1485. However, Henry VII had himself crowned king the day before, on the 21st of August. This may seem a bit odd, but there is actually a very good reason for this. That being that anyone who then fought against him at the Battle of Bosworth the day after on the 22nd of August, this meant that they were all traitors to the crown, because Henry could then smugly say after the Battle of Bosworth, well hold on a minute, I was already king for a day, so anyone fighting against me was a traitor, and this meant he could do pretty much anything he wanted against them, because that's the way things worked back in the Middle Ages. Of course, it's a bit cheeky, but really it worked because he was king and this was actually a viable option for him to take, which is why he did it in the first place. Now, on the 30th of October 1485, this is when he is, his official coronation happens. So there is a slight difference in between when someone can claim to be king, and when someone is crowned, and when someone is actually officially recognised by sort of the, the church and the, the state as well as being king. And this official coronation in um, London then happened on the 30th of October. Now, it's important that he did this before calling Parliament on the 7th of November, which was also needed to become king in essence. And the reason he does this is to show that he doesn't need Parliament to be king. His whole idea of how he became king, and which really he did, was through winning the Battle of Bosworth, not because he's reliant on anyone else. And this will be important later on about why he chooses to marry after becoming king as well, because he wants to show that he did this by himself. He did this through right of conquest, not right of parliament or right of marrying someone from the other royal family at the time in England. So on the 7th of December, he, uh, November, sorry, he calls parliament after his coronation. Now, of course, he had a lot of enemy nobility who he captured after the Battle of Bosworth. And I'm just going to take a look at all of them now, um, all the important ones, and what he did there. Because this is obviously important for consolidation of power, because the nobility in this period were the ones who could levy troops, levy retainers, and this is essentially what happened during the Wars of the Roses. So these were essentially people who could command mini armies. So he had to choose how he would deal with these people in order to stop the Wars of the Roses happening again. So the first one here is Henry Percy, the Duke of Northumberland. Now he was in command of part of Richard's army at Bosworth, but he didn't actually commit his troops to the battle, which directly resulted in Richard's defeat. Now I actually talked about this in the previous one, about whether he could have committed his troops or he didn't want to, or he was physically stopped, we're not entirely sure. But anyway, his father had been a loyal Lancastrian who had been killed at the very bloody Battle of Towton in 1461. Um, also, I'd like to point out that in the previous video, I mixed up Towton and Tewkesbury. Tewkesbury, uh, oh, I hope I haven't mixed it up again, actually. Um, I'm pretty sure Towton was in 1461 and Tewkesbury was in 1471. I think I've got it the right way around here. Um, but he then swore fealty to Edward IV and the Yorkists in 1469. So he's not from a traditionally Yorkist family. However, he did hold important Yorkist positions in Northern England. Now, the verdict for him was that he was imprisoned until 1486, although after that, after he has proved his loyalty, he was restored to his northern titles, and he was actually implemented in going on missions for the crown, which does show that Henry actually placed a considerable amount of trust in this guy. 
Now the next person was John de la Pole Jr. who was the Earl of Lincoln. Now he was Richard III's nephew and crucially he was also the heir. Richard III did have a son but this son died and after he died he named this guy his nephew the heir to the crown. So obviously he is a potential claimant and a rallying point for Yorkist resistance. Spoilers. So he also swore loyalty to King Henry after Bosworth and he didn't actually get sent to prison. Now, this is possibly to show that Henry was willing to forgive people on the other side of the Wars of the Roses, which had been one reason why it kept going, and he was actually invited to join the council after some period of time. Now, next up is actually his father, who is John de la Pole Sr., who is the Duke of Suffolk. Now, he was married um, to Elizabeth of York, so he was the brother-in-law of Edward IV and Richard III. Uh, quick clarification there, there are several Elizabeth of York during this period, um, so that's actually the, let me get this right, the grandmother of the Elizabeth of York who I'm going to mention in the uh, later on in this video, but it is a bit confusing. Um, he wasn't actually very involved in the Wars of the Roses, though he was politically aligned to the House of York through marriage, um, obviously because of his marriage to uh, Elizabeth of York, which is then why his son, John the Rapole Jr., is the nephew of Richard III, because Elizabeth of York is Richard III's sister, I think. Uh, it's, it's rather confusing, but they are connected by marriage, but essentially he wasn't that involved. And he also professed loyalty to the king, and because of this, Henry thought, well, he didn't really do much in the Wars of the Roses, He's probably not going to be a rallying point for Yorkist sympathy, so he was allowed to keep all of his lands and his titles. Again, it's the idea of the carrot and stick policy. Now, that does have a few meanings, I'm aware, um, although one way you can use that term is to look at the carrot is essentially when you're trying to, um, you know, uh, when you're being nice to people, when you're trying to win them over by currying favour, and the stick is when you're beating someone with a stick, so you're trying to beat them into submission. So here he is showing much more carrot than stick, because essentially, it's more effective sometimes to just leave people alone and then they will leave you alone. Now this next one is um, Thomas Howard who was the Earl of Surrey and he was the one who led Richard's troops at Bosworth alongside his father who was the Duke of Norfolk um, and he was actually killed during the battle, his father. So there might be cause for some revenge there which is why Henry treats him slightly differently. He also supported Richard's usurpation of the throne because of course after the um, first Yorkist king died who was Edward IV um, he had sons, the two sons, Richard and Edward, and they were both the princes who were the famous princes in the tower. Now, there is some debate about whether Richard killed them or whether someone else, you know, came, found them and then, uh, you know, chucked them in the river or something like that. But he's definitely blamed for it. And Richard actually usurped the throne in 1483. However, there was a split in the Yorkist faction at this point, And there were those who did not like the fact that Richard had usurped the throne and wanted to help the princes in the tower. They thought they were the rightful claimants to the throne. And this was called Buckingham's Rebellion. However... This guy, Thomas Howard, had fought against Buckingham's rebels, many of whom, after the failure of this rebellion, went over the channel to help Henry in his bid for the throne. So what happened to him? He was given an act of attainder, which is an important term for this period, which is essentially where all the titles and lands were stripped and they were exiled. And in 1487, actually, he does actually redeem this because the Earl of Lincoln, spoiler alert, John de la Pole, who I've just mentioned, he actually revolts against Henry. Now, my next episode is going to be part one of the rebellions. I've already decided to split it into two parts because there's uh, another spoiler alert. There are a lot of rebellions against Henry VII, but he's given him a chance to escape from uh, imprisonment. However, he refuses. So Henry thinks, wow, this guy uh, is trying to show his loyalty. So in 1489, he is released and the act of attainder is reversed, essentially returning his lands to him. Now, finally, we have this guy who is the Earl of Warwick. He was 10 years old, and I believe I'm writing saying he was the nephew of Richard III, so also a very strong claimant to the throne, and uh, he is just imprisoned in the tower because that's just something that Henry doesn't want to burn his fingers with. So next up, we obviously also have not just the people who fought against Henry who would be expecting punishment, but those who fought for Henry, because obviously they were fighting for him for a reason, and he needed to support and um, uh, reward his supporters. 
So, first of all, we see that a lot of the uh, more common guys fighting for him, or when I'm saying common, I mean lesser nobility, were giving knighthoods and titles. So, for instance, uh, his uncle, Jasper Tudor, was given the, uh, made the just Lord Justice of Wales, as well as the Lieutenant of Ireland. His, um, another of his friends, who was called Giles Daubeny, was initially a Yorkist, but he had fought against Richard III during Buckingham's Rebellion in 1483, was made Lord Chamberlain. Now, there was also a guy, he was also made the uh, Lord Lieutenant of Calais, which at that time was an English port town, obviously on the other side of the English Channel in northeastern France. And then we also have John Morton, who was also against Richard III's usurpation, and also a former Yorkist. So it's interesting that he tries to balance between and dis make a distinction between the Yorkists who had been lifelong committed Yorkists and allies of Richard III, and more original Yorkists who had been the allies of Edward IV. So it's quite a clever way that Henry sort of plays the Yorkist faction to try and win over support. But anyway, John Morton, he is made the Archbishop of Canterbury. So, of course, he inherits a country that is chronically divided. They had been at war since about the 1450s, arguably even earlier. And he needs to sort this out and unite everyone under one common rule. Obviously, his rule. He doesn't want the war to continue. He wants it to stop completely because now he is in power. So one way to do this is to symbolically do this. And of course, the two signs that came to represent the two factions or groups of families during this period were the White Rose of York and the Red Rose of Lancaster. And what he does is he combines these two to make the Tudor Rose, which was both red and white. And he started to put this symbol absolutely everywhere. If you look at uh, government buildings from the period, you will see lots of Tudor Roses and actually if you look at your one pence coin, if you are in, in the United Kingdom, you will see a portcullis. That portcullis is the Beaufort portcullis. Henry VII's mum was called Margaret Beaufort. Uh, and I believe, I'm not sure if the Tudor rose is on. Actually, I think it's on the 5P. Or the, I think it's on the 5P. Don't quote me on that. I'll have to have a look. Um, and of course, then later on, he needs to make a physical representation of the union of York and Lancaster like he did with the Rose. So what he does is he marries Elizabeth of York. This is the Elizabeth of York that was the daughter of King Edward IV. And she's very interesting because she is the daughter of the king, so when Edward IV was uh, king. Then she's also the sister of the king, who she was the sister of the princes in the tower, who was also king at one point. Then she was also the um, niece of the king when Richard III became king. And when she married Henry VII on the 18th of January, 1486, she became the wife of the king. A real turning point in the Wars of the Roses, because obviously now you have a claimant from the one side, Henry VII, marrying the daughter of the old Yorkist king. And this means that this is really a turning point in the period of the Wars of the Roses, that things are looking up. Real progress has been made in actually ending the Wars of the Roses, which was, of course, Henry VII's interest. Now, after they get married, they go on what's called a progress in March 1486, which is essentially where they go around the royal houses of the country. They go right the way up the north, right the way to York. Now, it's important why they go to York, because York was, of course, it's where the House of York gets its name, and also because that city, York, was actually a very pro-Richard III. Richard III did a lot of work in the north, which is why um, he is actually quite, quite well known in the north, actually, in York, things like that. There is a museum to Richard III, there's also a museum to Henry VII in York, actually, in some of the towers. Um, but it also showed that the king was powerful. It's a way for the king to go out and to see his people, and more importantly, for the people to see the king. And this showed that he had real power if he is making progresses around the country, because his predecessors hadn't really dared to, as in the last Lancastrian kings. They'd made progresses much more closely around London, which was what most monarchs did. They hardly ever left the southeast. But this was a real progress up into the north of the country, which had not really been seen before. Now, as well, of course, they had to make a physical embodiment of the Tudor Rose. Mm -hmm. 
and on the 20th of September 1486, this was indeed accomplished when Elizabeth of York gave birth to their first child, who they named Arthur, after the mythical prince from the Dark Ages. And of course, this was a huge deal for Henry and of course for Elizabeth as well that had a kid, which is great. But this was a big deal because they were the monarchs and now they had someone to succeed them, which, you know, it would take a lot longer for his son, Henry VIII, to do. But that's for another video. So guys, this has been part two in Henry VII, who ruled England from 1485 to 1501. I hope you have indeed enjoyed this video. If you have, I would really appreciate a thumbs up. If you'd like to know anything more, just comment anything below. And if you could share it with a mate who might find this interesting, then I would really appreciate that as well. As well as then tuning in for the next episode, which I think I'm going to try and upload two of these episodes every month. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for watching. I have been History with Hilbert, looking at some more Henry VII. Thank you all, and see you all very soon.